Hi, this is Dr. Kevin Windish from Sparks Pediatric and Adolescent Medicine. Welcome to our video series for students, residents, and other medical professionals. Please remember that this video is not intended to replace clinical education, nor is it intended to replace uh, visits to the physician for your own child. If we can be of assistance here, give us a call at area code 775-359-7111. We can't diagnose or treat over the phone, but we'll be happy to see your patient for you. Today what we want to talk about is brachial plexus injuries in the newborn. Now realize teenagers get brachial plexus injuries falling out of trees and playing football and being drugged by cars after skateboarding and all sorts of weird things, but we really want to avoid that discussion because those injuries are a little bit different. I want to talk about birth trauma, which in the pediatric realm really represents the majority of brachial plexus injuries. So let's back up a little bit and start with the very basic. What is the brachial plexus and, and why do we care about it? Brachial plexus is an area in the axilla where if you, if you have not done gross human anatomy, um, it's an area in the axilla that is where a series of nerve roots from the cervical and upper thoracic nerve regions come together. And they sort of recombine the nerves and then send them out to generate the nerves of the upper extremity. Those nerve roots start at C, usually at C5, 6, and 7, as well as C8, T1, once in a rare while, T2. Depending on the birth injury is which nerves are going to be involved, but many times the two major forms of brachial plexus injury will overlap and you just wind up with a nondescript brachial plexus injury. So although we're going to talk as if there's two very distinct forms, realize that clinically that gets to be pretty blurred. So bear with me when we get into that discussion. Let's first start with what are the causes of brachial plexus injury. The major cause of brachial plexus injury is complication of large for gestational age or cephalopelvic disproportion infants. What often transpires with the LGA and cephalopelvic disproportion infants is that they tend to wind up requiring mid forcep delivery or worse yet high forcep delivery. And during that you wind up placing torque on the neck and that often results in either palsy to or tearing of the nerves of the brachial plexus at the point of root insertion into the spinal cord. Uh, maneuvers to help deliver a baby with shoulder dystocia, another common complication of LGA and cephalopelvic disproportion. Um, also can be an issue because you again torque the neck and wind up tearing the nerve roots where they where they originate from the spinal cord or palsying the nerve roots where they originate from the spinal cord. Depending on which nerves are affected is what these syndromes will look like. So the first and most common syndrome that you're going to see is Herb's palsy. And so to demonstrate what you'll see in an Herb's palsy, once again we'll zoom out, and I know I'm close, is what is known as the waiter's tip. The arm is often held adducted up against the chest, the elbow is extended, and the wrist is often flexed, much like a waiter asking for a tip. When you perform the moral reflex maneuver, if done properly, that arm often will not move. And that's the big reason we're doing uh, an, or, or a moral reflex. I will be doing a video later demonstrating a moral reflex. And when I demonstrate that, pay close attention to how we do the moral reflex because many people actually perform a moral reflex inappropriately and do a stretch receptor reflex. And if you're doing that, you will miss the herb's palsy. You need to do a proper moral each time if you wish to pick it up. The herb's palsy is usually caused by uh, palsy or damage to C5, 6, 7 with a little bit of damage to C8, uh, but usually C8 is relatively intact. Lower brachial nerve injury, C8, T1, and if the brachial plexus involves T2, uh, often results in what's called Klumke's palsy, and that results more in a claw-like hand, inability to extend the fingers, often with the arm flexed. 
Okay. In both cases, how do we treat it? Well, we start by resting the brachial plexus and getting pressure off the brachial plexus. You do that by pinning the arm up and across the chest. That can be done with diapers, that can be done with a sling, that can be done however in the hospital. Usually you just call PT and they'll take care of it for you. That patient should be followed post postpartum by physical therapy because regardless of how minor the injury, strengthening that upper extremity is going to be critical as the child grows. This is very painful because it often involves uh, what well, involves the nerves, and these nerves also carry cutaneous receptors. Consequently, NSAID therapy is often necessary. Occasionally, opiate therapy is necessary, and rarely you wind up using something like Lyrica to help control the pain because this is a neurogenic pain and it can be severe. And I've certainly had children who couldn't leave the ICU for weeks on end because of difficulty controlling their pain and difficulty eating we need to manage that aggressively. Occasionally, instead of palsying the nerve, what has happened is you've actually torn the nerve roots. If that happens, the paraly it's a true paralysis, not a paresis, and it is permanent. If that happens, early referral to neurosurgery for nerve root reimplantation is very important. If you're not sure if you've torn the roots, early evaluation by a neurosurgeon to see if that's what happened is important. The neurosurgeons can tell. Uh, and that's what they're there for, so don't be afraid to get them involved. You can also involve a neurologist sometimes if there's a lot of pain or a lot of difficulty or you're not sure what's going on. Neurology can often be a value with you for this. Also, if you're having difficulty obtaining services for physical therapy postpartum, a uh, neurologist can usually make that come to fruition for you if the insurance companies are balking at this. So. Uh, a good appropriate diagnosis is important because with aggressive management, as long as the nerve roots aren't torn, most of these children do very well and often have near equal strength for their entire adult life. And uh, the differences in strength, if they're there at all, really can only be picked up on physical exam maneuvers and are something that you may be able to detect in the clinic, but in the real world aren't of a whole lot of consequence. If you're aggressive early on, Left alone for six months before you, eva before you evaluate and before you manage this, this child will forever have significant defects in this extremity. So you got to be on the ball with this one. I hope this has helped to enlighten you about a very common but somewhat complicated injury that we deal with in pediatrics. If we can be of assistance, again, give us a call at 359-7111. That's area code 775. We'll see you next time.